We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light who has shown one more song before the lesson. Let's all stand as we sing. The God of the heavens, the ancient of days, the God of our fathers, and God of
church and all the time. Glad you're here with us. I am so excited that Buddy Bell is here to share a lesson with you. We had, as uh, Matt mentioned, a great men's retreat. We thank you so much, guys, for showing up, for uh, being there, and I know you were blessed by that. I know I was blessed by that time together. Uh, Buddy has, uh, I've known him a long time. He's a, he's a friend. He's a, he's a great servant of God, and it's exciting to have him. He is the preaching minister at the Landmark Church of Christ. Been there 21 years. Been preaching about 40 years. He doesn't look that old, but he has five grandchildren. He's been married 30 years. Stephanie got four children. Uh, three of them are married. One's getting ready to graduate from Lipscomb University. He serves on the board of directors at Lipscomb University. He wears many hats, not just as a leader in his church, not only as a father, as a husband, as a grandfather, but he is a tremendous servant of God that has a passion for Jesus Christ. In fact, this is what I can say about him. His purpose, his passion is to lift up Jesus and call people to follow him. That sounds familiar, doesn't it, church? Because we are a church that be one, make one, and send one. We're going to make Jesus' final command our first priority. And Buddy is here to help us with that. So Buddy, come up here. We'll say a prayer. And I'll let you get started. They're giving you more time than they usually give me. So preach on, brother. Almighty God, I thank you for Buddy. I thank you for his presence here. I thank you for shaping, molding his heart. You've brought him here for this time and this purpose to your glory. And I pray that your spirit would be with him and your spirit would be with each of our hearts. That it will be open to hear your message. Not just hear it, but be doers of that message, Father, in our lives. And it's through your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, thank you, Joe, for that nice introduction. I'm so, so excited about being here. I'm glad that you're still here. I sort of got the idea a moment ago that the kids were ready to get out of here. Did you think that? Uh, Joe and Tina are going to get the kids out of here. Did you think that? Uh, they moved on and you're here. You know, I've had such a great time on this men's retreat. Love the folks who serve on your staff or your ministry staff. Got to know some of your elders and, and men. And I, I just left so pumped up. And, and what I'm convinced of, the more I read scripture, the older I grow, is that this thing really is all about relationships. I, I think Jesus said that, didn't he? Somebody said, Jesus, tell us what the top commandment is. What, what is most important in Jesus? Let me tell you this. Is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the whole shebang. That's what it's about. And so I love all the relationships I get to be a part of. Thank you, Joe, for mentioning I'm a grandfather. I think I have the coolest grandfather name. It is Grand Buddy. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that. But, you know, when we talk about relationships, guys, I, I want to say this. And we're going to be talking about relationships in, in this hour and also in the Bible class hour. You will never be everything you could be for God unless you are in spiritual relationships. And that's the way Christians grow healthy. It's fascinating how, how the world begins to agree with us about what Jesus said. There's been some major universities over the last couple of decades that have done some studies on the importance of good friendships and the difference they make. They actually have determined that good friendships are good for your health. One major university compared people with unhealthy health habits to people with healthy health habits. Obviously, the healthy health habits people lived longer. But then they put a different factor in it, and they ended up with two study groups. One with healthy health habits and no good friends, and the other with unhealthy health habits and a few good friends. And they found out the most amazing thing. The people with unhealthy health habits and a few good friends were healthier and lived longer than the folks that were health nuts with no friends. Which all goes to prove when we get through here today, it'd be healthier for us to go and eat Ralph's donuts together <laughs> than to go home and eat broccoli by ourselves, okay? Be much better. Uh, hey, amen. Now we're going, okay? Uh, uh, another she studied it this way. They infected 276 people with the common cold. And again, they got two study groups, one with good friendships, one without good friendships. They found out people who had good friendships were less likely to catch the cold. If they did catch the cold, they kept it a shorter period of time. And I don't know how they measured this, but they actually produced less mucus. Sorry about that thought. But it proves what you and I have always known 
unfriendly people are snottier than friendly people. <laughs> Absolutely. So guys, this morning, I want to challenge you about these relationships. Because when Jesus left this earth, Jesus pretty much bet the farm on it. You know, sometimes answers are so simple in front of us, and yet we miss it. We, we make Christianity so complicated that we miss the simplicity of what we're called to do, and then we don't do it. We get up all uptight about all these things Jesus didn't even talk about, and we neglect the things he did talk about. And we end up getting off mission. I, I love the story of the London Transit Authority. A few years ago, they were having some problems with their bus line in London. The buses were running. They were running on time. But they were neglecting to pick the passengers up at the bus stop. They just rode right past it. And finally, there was this big public outcry. And everybody protesting what in the world was going on. This is true story. The London Transit Authority issued the famous, this following infamous statement. Here's what they said. We cannot, stop, we cannot run our buses on time if we have to stop and pick people up. <laughs> now give me a break, guys. That's what they're there for. And sometimes the church, guys, we get so busy running everything on time and being so nicely organized. I love all those things that we forget to do the really basic things, which is to love people. In fact, Jesus bet the whole farm on this. Um, Jesus said, if you're going to be different, if we're going to make a difference, if we're going to grow, what's it going to take? What will really matter? Look at, look at John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. We've already mentioned it twice in the service. We need to mention it again. Look what Jesus said. A new commandment I give you, love one another. Now, now here we're going to find out why it's new. Old Testament people were commanded to love each other. Here's why it's new. As I have loved you. What's different? You love one another the same degree that I have loved you, so you must love one another. Guys, guys, our standard is we are to love people the way Jesus has loved us. Man, that changes everything about your life. And not only does it change everything about our life together, but changes everything about our impact on our community. Because Jesus said, by this, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. My friends, the identifying mark of God's church is that we love better than anybody else. And so this morning, I want to present a really simple message. I want to talk about three giant signs. I, I call them laws of Jesus community. Because some of us who've been in this for a while, we literally forget how radical Christianity is. And, and how it turned every social norm upside down. And, and so I want, to, I want to present to you three, what I actually call billboards, that belong on every church. They belong on every core group in this church. They belong in every family. Here's the first billboard. Everyone is welcome. Say that with me. Everyone is welcome. Guys, do you realize how radical that was? When Jesus comes, I mean, Jesus accepts all kinds of people, even in his inner circle. I mean, just think about two of the apostles. You've got Matthew. What was he? Tax collector. People like tax collectors? Shake your head like this. No, they didn't like tax collectors. If you don't know, just sort of go like this, all right? People like, they hated tax collectors. They were turncoat traitors. They hated them. But Jesus also picked a guy named Simon the Zealot. Now, now talk about not liking tax collectors. Si Zealots especially didn't like them. In fact, Zealots made it their job to go to guerrilla warfare around, around Israel where they would kill Roman soldiers and guess who else? Tax collectors. Can you imagine the first finger food Sunday night fellowship these two dudes have? Uh, my name's Matthew. My name's Simon. What do you do, Matthew? I'm a tax collector. What do you do, Simon? I'm a zealot. Matthew says, sorry, wrong church. I'm, I'm out of here. Why? Because if Matthew had met, if Simon had met Matthew in a dark alley in Jerusalem before they both met Jesus, Simon would have slit Matthew's neck. And yet Jesus invites all of these people into this wonderful community. In fact, if, if we could be honest here, the greatest criticism of Jesus' ministry, what really riled people up more than anything else, is that he hung out with the wrong people. 
I mean, the Pharisees cannot imagine that this guy can be God because if God came to the earth, he, they knew he would hang out with righteous people like them. He would not hang out with sinners. Look at Luke chapter 15, verse 2 in this criticism. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, now here, they think with that one sentence, they can shut down Jesus' ministry. Because a godly prophet, rabbi, whatever you want to call Jesus, would never eat with sinners. And yet, as I talked with the men yesterday, I think this was an unintended compliment for Jesus. I think when they said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them, I think our Lord said, thank you very much. That's exactly who I want to be. And so Jesus has this radical community that begins to accept people that other people didn't accept. Now, you got to get this, guys. The disciples didn't get this at first. They were uncomfortable with Jesus breaking down the social and ethic, eth eth ethical and even racial barriers. That Jesus would hang out with sinners. In, in fact, when, when Jesus talks to that Samaritan woman at the well, they think he's gone crazy. They're like, we got, we got to get out of here, Jesus. You, you don't talk to a woman in public, more or less a half-breed Samaritan woman. Leave this place. They don't seem to get it. But here's the cool deal. After the resurrection of Jesus and after the Holy Spirit has come upon them, they get it. And, and they establish a, a culture, a community, unlike anything the world had ever known. And people were shocked at the kind of people they accepted and they loved. I mean, let's talk about one. Let me give you a, a quotation from a historian in AD 140 named Aristides. And, and what he's talking about is the slaves among them. I mean, that's, can you imagine? In, in the first century, you got a church with slave and slave owners. It breaks down that barrier. And, and Aristides, this historian, writes, any slave they have among them, they persuade to become Christians because of their love toward them. And this is so crazy. They become brothers without discrimination. Nobody had ever seen a culture like that. You don't see cultures like that in our world today where there's caste systems and there's, you know, different economic levels. Uh, look at this. Look at this quotation from a guy named Pliny the Younger. All right. He was the governor of Turkey. He was actually the brother of Pliny the Older. And he had another brother named Pliny the Tiny. Well, not really. But anyway, he's the governor of Turkey. And uh, these Jesus people have messed up the economy. Because people aren't purchasing their idols. And so he thinks he's going to knock this thing out. He arrests two Christian women who happen to be slaves. And he thought nobody would care. Just slaves. And the Christian community, the church, rose up to defend him. And he writes this. Many persons of every age, every status, and also both sexes are at risk of joining this church. Here's what he called it. This contagion. He thought it was a contagious disease. It was contagious, amen? But it was not a disease. It spread not only to cities, but to villages and farms. But he says, it seems possible to check it and to cure it. Was Pliny the Younger right? Dude, they could not check this thing. There, there, there might have been 50,000 Christians at this point. It was only a few decades later, there's 60 million. It goes crazy because they are accepting everyone. Uh, poor people, look at what, what Julian said about, about poor people. I think that when the poor were overlooked by the priests, that's the Roman priests, the impious Galatians, that's Christians, it says, the impious Galatians noticed how the poor were being overlooked and devoted themselves to their benevolence. Nobody else in this kind of culture, even the, the religious people, really cared about poor people. Except these disciples of Jesus who'd watched him and who got it and now love him. And even if we, if we sick people, there are stories in the first and second century that when, when a, a disease would, would envelop a city uh, and they would try to quarantine the disease, here's what would happen. All the healthy people in the city would leave the city to leave the sick people so they didn't catch it. But here's what happened. As the healthy people left the city, the surrounding villages 
Christian people came into the city to minister to the sick. Nobody had ever seen anything like this. They loved everybody. It's like Romans chapter 15, verse 7 says, we are to accept one another just as Christ has accepted you in order to bring praise to God. My friends, this church will bring praise to God when its diversity is so evident that you accept people and you welcome them. So our, our first point, it's very clear from Jesus' life and the early church's life. Everyone is welcome. Say that with me again. Everyone is welcome. Let's make our second billboard. Here's the second point. Nobody is perfect. Say that with me. Nobody is perfect. Don't be punching your spouse, okay? Nobody, say it. Some of you aren't saying it. Nobody is perfect. In fact, John writes, if anybody claims to be without sin, he is a what? Liar. And the truth is not in him. Guys, everyone's welcome. Here's the cool thing. Nobody's perfect. So let me ask you a question. Why do so many of us come to church and try to act like we're perfect? I mean, it's, it's that church game, you know, that I come and I dress up and I look nice and I act like, and I say the right answers, the right questions, but I don't want anybody to know. I remember a woman saying to me once, the last place I would share my questions would be, my problems would be at church. How, what a shame. I'm convinced this church is different than that. I say to people who come through our new member class at Landmark, I say, you know, we're going to greatly disappoint you if you're looking for a perfect church because you're not going to find it here. And if you do find a perfect church, here's what I say. Don't you dare join it <laughs> because you'll mess it up, okay? <laughs> so would I. And yet we, we want to act like everything's perfect. I, I'll never forget when I was a, a youth minister. Some of you will remember old enough. I, and I actually did a youth rally at this church probably 30 years ago. But uh, I was youth minister and our, our teen group was in charge of VBS. So I got one of the teenagers to come up with this brochure that we were going to give out to thousands of homes. And, and so the brochure, it was when the movie E.T. was really big, okay? So it was a cute little brochure. It said, E.T. go where? VBS, okay? <laughs> E.T. go VBS. So one Wednesday night, man, we brought the church together. We gave out thousands of them and we said, everybody go give these out. I'll never forget walking to the back of the auditorium and this tall, uptight man, uh, he, he corners me and he said, hey, did you see this brochure? Yeah. Did you approve this brochure? He said, did you see it? It says E.T. Go VBS. And when you open it up, it's got Superman flying to VBS. He said, what, what do you think about this brochure? Well, I said, well, the print job's not that good, but, but I like it. He says, no. Do you realize in the movie E.T. he drank a beer? And do you remember in the last Superman movie, he cussed? Now, I wish I'd been quick enough at that point. I, was just, I wish I'd said, sir, do you not realize that VBS is for sinners like E.T. and Superman, okay? <laughs> But I wasn't quick enough. Guys, why do we try to keep this image that we've got it together? Guys, the church is going to explode when we stop pretending that we have together and we start doing what the Bible tells us to do is to confess our sins one another. One of my favorite things about the church I preach for, man, we are not a perfect church. We've got lots of things to work, for, work on. Is that there is not a Sunday that goes by that there's not open confession of sin on the front row. It happens. And, and what I found in that, you guys have been there, you understand that? What I found in that is, is what that does is it draws people. Because people go, you know what? Uh, let me tell you this story. Get to that point. Uh, a few years ago, we we're having friend day. This little one-year-old girl goes to her school. And, I mean, excuse me, first grade. <laughs> That'd be a pretty sharp one-year-old girl. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got some cool kids. But, um... Uh, this first grader went to her school, and she knew we were all trying to invite, so she invited a first grader to come. Well, the first grader went home and told her mom, she had the invitation card, and her mom said, well, okay, I'll go. Her mom had not been in church in 20 years. She'd grown up in church, rebelled, been pretty, um, you know, pretty, pretty wild, and was trying to settle down a little bit, but she came to church. She came to church that Sunday, and we had this family on stage giving their testimony. Uh, the husband had been hooked on pornography. The wife had struggled with her sexuality. And one of the sons had struggled also. And so they're, they're being honest about this. And they're talking about how God has changed them. 
And um, I called, the lady's name was Denise Perkins. I called Denise that afternoon. I said, Denise, we were so glad to have you at Landmark this morning. Thank you for coming. And she said, you know, I was just, I was just shocked when that family got up in there. They were, they were willing to share so openly about what they struggle with. And, and, and uh, she said, you know, I, I sat there and, you know, first of all, I was shocked that I walked in the building and the roof didn't fall in. And, and then when they started sharing, I, I thought I'd look around the church and people would be making fun of them. And, and then I, I just saw tears. And, and after church, I saw everybody embrace them. And here's what she said. And then... I thought to myself, I might could make it in this church. My friends, us pretending we got it together doesn't help us and it doesn't help the outsider coming in. Because the truth is, if we'd all be honest, nobody in this place is perfect. You know, I don't even know all you guys, but I know this. Every one of you is a sinner. What an encouraging word. I mean, everybody in here has got some kind of problem. And so we got to keep these billboards up. We want to welcome everybody. No one's perfect. And then let's, let's get to the last billboard. This is so encouraging. Anything is possible. Say that with me. Anything is possible. Okay, let's say them all three. Everyone's welcome. Nobody's perfect. Anything's possible. See, this is where we get to the Jesus, the Holy Spirit part. You see, what our, our culture says to us today is that you cannot change. You, 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 I mean, you know, if you've got this inclination, if you've got this struggle, just go ahead and accept who you are and stop fighting it. Because people can't change. You're just, you're just wired that way and nothing's going to happen. It's your upbringing, it's your biology, it's whatever, and you, you can't change. I'm not just talking about one topic, I'm talking about lots of topics. And, and, and kids grow up thinking that. I, I never forget, back in those same VBS days, I was single, I lived in this apartment complex, and I, I started inviting some of the little kids around my complex. First night, I filled my little car up. Second, this will tell you how old I am. Second night, I borrowed one of our members' station wagon <laughs> with that wonderful way back seat that looks the other way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and so the next day, I went to my apartment complex. I got all these little kids to go to VBS with me. I'm sitting on the front row of the station wagon with two little four-year-old kids. And, um, you know, I tell the kids on the way back from VBS, I said, if you guys will invite some more of your friends, I'll bring the church van tomorrow night. And to them, that was really a big deal. And a little kid sitting beside me said, well, I'll invite Johnny. And the kid beside him says, you can't invite Johnny, he cusses. And the other kid said to him, you do too. <laughs> and the little kid said, but when I get mad, I can't help it. Because we're growing up a generations that think change is not possible. And, and guys, that's the story of Scripture, is that no, we're not perfect, but we don't have to stay that way. Jesus didn't save us for us just to come here and confess the same sins over and over again. He saved us so that we could be different. Now, I'm not even going to show this one on the screen. I want you to open your Bible, get on your phone. Uh, go, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, okay? There's an amazing set of verses here, not very politically correct, but man, they are powerful. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, start with me in verse 9. Or, or do you not know that wrongdoers, Paul says, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Pretty nice list there, isn't it? Now watch this. And that is what some of you, key word, were. Say it with me. Were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. Well, what's Paul saying, man? You all came in here and nobody was perfect, but you came in this place, my friends, and everything began to change. Because God has got the power to mold us and to change us. Anything's possible. And here's what's going to happen in your church. I'm sure it already has happened. It's, it's the person with the bad background that's really blown it that helps people. It, it, it's advice 
who overcame his cocaine addiction in our church, who helps more people than anybody else. It's Tim Lee who overcame his addiction to gambling, almost lost everything he had, very, very successful man, who now helps lots of people. It's Trey Hayes, a 32-year-old young man who got addicted to pornography when he was 13 years old and finally overcame it at 30, who now helps so many people. Because when I meet somebody addicted to pornography, I say, I'm going to hook you with Trey. You know, it's Austin Saunders who stood up in Easter and talked about the terrible divorce he had been through and how God had rescued him through that and has now changed him and given him a different life because he encountered a community of people who said, you know what, everyone's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything is possible. And things begin to change. And so my challenge to you guys this morning is do those billboards belong on this church? Do those, I see some folks shaking their head, yes, amen. Do those billboards belong on your core group? Do they belong on the campus ministry? Do they belong on the youth ministry? Do they belong on all of us? We started small groups a few years ago, and we got everybody to put three big signs on their front door. Everybody's welcome. Nobody's perfect. Anything is possible. Come on in here and let's let God work. And I challenge you, when we begin to be that kind of community, you know, guys, I told you earlier, this was crazy radical in the first century. And I am convinced with all the racial hostility today, all the political hostility, that this is every bit as radical today as it was then. And, and when we create a community, we're rich and poor accepted, black and white, Republicans and Democrats, you name it. Tennessee and Alabama fans. I mean, when you begin, <coughs> you guys are not going to accept me. I can tell it just by your look, okay? <laughs> when we create a community where everyone is accepted, guys, it's going to step, it's going to stick out. Because, guys, there are bigger things in that mess. We're, we're united not because we agree on all of that kind of stuff. We're united because we agree that we all love Jesus. And he begins to mold us in this community where we're inviting people and we're welcoming people and we're confessing together. And we've got all these testimonies floating around of changed lives. And yours may not be radical like cocaine. Yours may be, you know what? I suffer from depression or I've got some anxiety attacks. Or, you know, the truth is I'm really greedy. Or as a young parent confessed on our front row a few weeks ago, I've made baseball too important in my family. And my friends, when, when we begin to, to have that kind of culture and people begin to change, I'm telling you, I like what Rick Warren says. The greatest tool in a growing church is the power of a changed life. You see, quite frankly, I look at Jesus, I'm sort of intimidated. How about you? Because he was perfect. And that's why I think in the Bible, there's all these stories of these messed up disciples. Because we needed to know about them. And guys, some people are going to come in here and they're going to fall in love with Jesus. But if you don't be open with them and loving with them and confessional with them, they're going to be intimidated. They're going to go, you know what? Ain't no way I could ever be like that. To be a Christian like Jesus? So do these billboards, let's get even more practical here before we close out. Do these billboards belong in your life? Is that the way you treat people? It's your work, it's your school, in your neighborhood. Everybody's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything's possible. A few years ago, me and my, my sons went on a, a mission trip to Malawi, Africa. We got a mission point there, an orphanage. And it was an incredible experience to us. But Malawi is the second most impoverished country in the world, and hardly anything works. Okay, so, so you might have power for three days and not have it for five days. You'll have running water for a day or two, and then you won't have it for a day or two. You might, you know, line up a meeting with a government official, and, and you go, you know, Thursday at 10 o'clock, and he doesn't show up until Friday at 1 o'clock. I mean, just, it, it, it's just crazy. And so, you know, while we're there, we start going, okay, why doesn't anybody show up on time? And why didn't the water run? And, and here's what they would say, okay? They would simply say, oh, sorry, buddy, that's Malawi. That's just Malawi. They just accepted that was the way it's going to be. Let me tell you how, how pitiful it was. Let me tell you about another billboard. 
If you're riding down Malawi streets, there, there was a billboard that appeared over and over again. Obviously, they had some beer they made that they were proud of. But listen to me. Here's what the billboard showed. It showed a beer bottle, and here was their slogan. Possibly the best tasting beer in the world. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> We're not too sure about this thing. And, and guys, when I was in Malawi, I just wanted to stop and go, stop it. Stop saying that's Malawi. Stop accepting it. But sometimes at the Landmark Church, you know, we go, oh, everybody's late. Well, that's just Landmark. Uh, not many souls are being saved right now. Well, that's just Landmark. Uh, not many people are really interested in getting into deep Bible study. Well, that's just, I mean, I want to say, no, man. We're the people who don't accept those kind of things. We're the people who think that God can change things. And I think about things, I don't know, in this church that maybe you just are accepting. And, and you, maybe you don't say the words, but it's the Spirit. Is Well, that's just sort of what college side is like. We don't confess our sins openly. We don't reach out, and we don't go to the other areas of the community. My friend, my challenge is for us to look at just the basic laws of Jesus' community and look how that early church just followed in Jesus' footsteps. And for us to do the same. So this morning... Jesus said it this way. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. That you love one another. Don't stop there. That you love one another as I have loved you. Because that's the way they're going to know us. Not because of our worship style or not because some of our belief systems, but because we love people in a different way than anybody else. And my friends, when we become that community, it's going to be a magnet. I'm telling you what, it trumps every other of the church growth ideas. You got to do this, you got to do this, you can't do this. My friends, when people find this kind of community that they can't find anywhere else, they can't even find this in lots of churches. Man, I'm telling you, they are drawn. So this morning, as, as we plead with God, and we're about to pray, and the elders will be in the back, and the elders will be up front, if you're ready to become a follower of Jesus and be baptized and start your life all over again, if you've not done that because you've, not, because you've accepted the world that says, you're just the way you are and you can't change, and you've tried to change yourself and you can't, I'm telling you what you need to do. You need to meet Jesus at his death, burial, and resurrection. And the same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit, will change your life. And, it, and if you've been a person, that you've been a part of this church, but, but honestly, you know, those billboards don't belong in your life. That's not the way you're treating the people in this church or outside this church. And today you want to recommit yourself to be on the mission of Jesus. Now let me just tell you, make you comfortable for this. Nobody's perfect in this place. And so why do we pretend? And so today, if you're tired of pretending and you're ready to get honest, meet your shepherds and let us pray for you before you walk out of here. Do that right now while we stand together and sing. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here. I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. And
my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you, when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, Just a few moments, we're gonna we're gonna go a little bit deeper, and we're gonna talk about the place where this happens more naturally than any other place, and, and that's in homes, that's in your core groups, that's exactly the way it was in the first century, and so please come join us, especially you know if, if you're in a core group or you're even thinking about being one, or you're a leader, or you might be. I'm telling you, there's a lot of you out there that could lead these groups, that could do beautiful jobs. You don't have to be a Bible scholar, you don't have to know every answer to every question. But you join us and we'll talk about that and, and work on that. Uh, so we invite all of you to join us and let's, let's take the lesson we had this morning, a next step, and let God bless that. Thank you, buddy. And uh, that's going to be in a small auditorium in just a second. Yeah, but Hannah Bernhardt, would you come up here, please? I don't think that was me. I, if it was, I'm sorry. Hannah We've got some other prayer requests here in just a second, but we want to... Hannah gave her life to Jesus Christ last week. Isn't that wonderful? I love the Bernhardt family, and I love Hannah. I wish I had a son her age. That wasn't that funny. She is a heart of gold. I just, uh, I just grown to love her through the years. To see all the talent and ability God has given to her, and to see her give her life to Jesus, to know that God's got great plans for her. Hannah, we have something we want to present to you: a certificate to remember, and a Bible to guide your life. Uh, your parents have brought you this far, and they have relied on God's word to guide your life. And this right here will bless you for years and years to come. And I'm just really excited to know that you're a sister in Christ with us. And we're going to pray when these guys come up here and say prayers for these. They're going to include you in that prayer. So uh, we love you. And this is your family. And we are excited that you're a part of it. God bless you, hon. Boyd. Um, Jody Balk has come forward tonight and she's asked for us uh, tonight, this morning, uh, and asked for us uh, to pray for her marriage and we want to honor uh, that as we pray for uh, both of these. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, you're an awesome God. You are indeed perfect. You've created the world to be perfect. But we confess that we are indeed not perfect. We sin on a daily basis. We fail to do the things that you would have us to do 
We do things that you would have us not do. But Father, you knew that that's how we would be and you knew and gave us a way to make ourselves perfect. To put Jesus on in baptism, wash away all of our sins, and to start a walk with you. And Father, we're thankful for Hannah's choice to do that. We're thankful that she has chosen the path that will lead to life, to life more abundantly. That she has chosen a path that will help her along the way when things are not going right. And we uh, are so thankful for her decision. And we ask that you would be with her church family as we continue to, uh, to help her grow, to help her to love you more each day. And Father, likewise, we, we want to pray now for Jody. The burdens of the world can be so great at times. They can weigh on our shoulders and make us bow our heads. But Father, we know that in our lowest moment, in our worst time, that you are there that you can pick us up and will pick us up. And Father, I just, I pray for Jody's relationship. I pray that you would open her heart, her eyes to see your glory. Pray that you would open her husband's heart and eyes in the same way. That both of them can turn to you can realize that whatever the hurt, it can be healed. Whatever the problem, it can be changed. That in whatever way their love has been crushed, that it can be regrown. And I just ask for that help right now and throughout the coming days and weeks, that each day will be better than the day before. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Brian Wharton also comes this morning stating that he's uh, been dealing with anger and just has not been living the Christian life that he wants to live and knows that he needs to live. So will you bow with me, please? Father, we just thank you for Brian's heart, his willingness to conf confess his sins. Father, we just ask that you bless him, be with us to help him as he walks. May his walk with you get stronger each day and for him to be the Christian that you would like for him to be and that he can be a shining light for you. Father, we just thank you for you being our Father, for the blessings that you give us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What I'm about to say is going to come as a surprise to some of you, but hardly any of you. But I'm not perfect. And I don't even play a perfect tele person on television, so. And I want to uh, apologize to Joe before he leaves. I've made fun of how many times he refers to having a grandchild up here, and this week it happened and he didn't say anything. So I, and uh, I just want to ask Buddy if the study about the common cold, if they found out that the people who had friends gave it to them. <laughs> you know, you got to study all those things, so. And I hope that at College Side, the programs don't get in the way of the people. I don't think they do. I think we've, we've looked at that very carefully. Joe will be at the starting point, albeit briefly. Starting point's back in the hallway. It's a, it's a place where you can stop and visit with Joe and find out more about 
college side, how to join us in a more permanent way, how to get involved and how to be part of those billboards. Uh, the Golf League, great day to announce golf, right? The Golf League will, just one second. I don't know when it's going to, oh, it's going to start the first Thursday in May at Ironwood Golf Course, see Roger Fox or Bobby Garrison. And uh, that's an unapproved announcement. So I'm thinking about the billboard thing. I wonder if, if I have enough room on my forehead, I could write the billboards on my forehead and people would know what I was about, but I think they might look at me and think that wasn't a good idea. But I hope we can write those billboards on our hearts. So I hope this week I'd like for you, I thought about saying invite, but that's not the right word. I ask you to bring someone into your life. Bring somebody into your life and treat them in such a way that they know they belong. Would you stand with me as we go to the Father? Almighty, we thank you that we have been blessed to be here today. God, I just, uh, I, I want to ask you to help us to be a place to belong. Help those billboards be a part of our lives. God, I want to ask your, your blessings on, on uh, uh, these two folks that are asking for our prayers today. And uh, they're not the only ones. They're the ones who had the courage to, to, uh, to ask. And God, we just ask that you will bless each one of us as we go out of this room today, that we will, will uh, be more committed to, to being who you want us to be and what you want us to be. And God, we ask that you will, will uh, uh, bless Buddy and his ministry and, and uh, the words that he's brought us today to help, help us to uh, open our hearts more to you because of that. And we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen.